again. Um, Scott, thanks for joining us. Um, we know that you have to hop off around nine. Is that still? Yeah, uh, possibly about five five minutes yeah. before. Um, just Certainly. so everybody knows, you know, I'm, I'm, this uh, the Yale Festival is scheduled at the, exactly the same time as another event that I'm uh, attending with my film being shown and I'm going to do a Q&A at nine o'clock. Yeah, so well, we appreciate your time and um, we, we've all just seen your um, movie. And um, I think, um, I don't know, did you have a chance to see um, the uh, either of the other two movies? Scott? I watched them both, yes, I watched them okay, both. Okay, good, okay. So um, everybody, my name is Gordon Jabal. I work here at the School of the Environment and um, I, I want to um, do two things that are a little bit different. I want to let you hear from the, the key people, um, the directors and the people that produced two of the movies, um, so that you hear from them directly. And then I'm going to throw it right to you. So think of your questions. It's I don't even know where to start in terms of thinking about how they are put together. I do want to thank Sam. Sam, that was an amazing group of movies. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gordon. And I also, sorry, we're a bit frazzled here. I wanted to give a quick introduction to Gordon as well. I know he introduced himself briefly, but uh, I have an in introduction here and it'll, it'll tie in a few things. But uh, Dr. Dr. Jabal is, is a lecturer in urban ecology uh, at the Yale School of the Environment. Um, his PhD, after completing his PhD here in biology, um, he has been engaged with graduate and undergraduate students on topics ranging from international conservation conferences to sustainable development to urban ecology in New Haven. Uh, he's a director of the New Haven Watershed Fund, a member of the Quinnipiac River Advisory Committee, and chair of the International Festival of Arts and Ideas in New Haven, among other community and civic uh, involvement. He's the author, along with uh, Herbert Borman and Diana Balmori, uh, of Redesigning the American Lawn, A Search for Environmental Harmony. Uh, the first edition, published in 2000, was inspired by Dr. Jabal Balmori and Borman's 1991 graduate seminar, The American Lawn, uh, which sought to use the lawn as a vehicle to teach broader environmental principles. This thoroughly researched book explores the architectural, ecological, economic, and cultural story of the American lawn while profiling residents like Sarah and Dave uh, who decided to think differently about their own backyards. So that's a little bit of background um, that'll guide this discussion. Okay. Okay, can you hear us? Sound check. Hello, test. Hello, test. Testing. Okay, when Scott, how are you? Hello. Hello. Good. Hi. Okay. Right now, I have. I can just see an audience shot. Am I supposed to see anybody else? That's yeah, okay. On it. We're okay. we're uh, we see you, and the audience. It's important for the audience to see you. That's okay. See, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Scott. Um, <laughs> oh, there we are. There we are. <laughs> Um, I thought I wanted to start out um, to the three of you and do something a little bit unconventional. Could you reflect on your view of the other movies that you saw? Uh -huh. So we're going to have a chance to ask you questions about the movie you made, but it's, I think it'd be interesting to hear um, from your point of view what you thought, um, what you thought was effective, uh, what you liked, how you maybe thought the movies fit together. Um, I don't know if one of you wants to start off on that. It's sort of unconventional, but I want the audience to have a chance to hear you and hear your take on movie making, on what you were trying to do through watching the other movies. Scott, you want to try and tackle Sure, that? sure. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I, I, I thought it was a great program and I love I loved being part of it. Um, and the movies are so different from each other uh, yeah. in so many ways uh, that they really did complement each other. There's so many ways you can make documentaries, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I, I'll say that uh, uh, Sarah's movie was particularly fun for me to watch because I have a small house in, in New Jersey with a backyard, and I've, okay. and I've been trying, been trying to to do gardening there, and actually somewhat successfully. The yard is quite beautiful, but but I got so involved, and I was actually writing down all the names of the the different <laughs> species that you have in yours. I, mean, I got to get one of those. I'll give you a plant list, Scott. <laughs> it's great. So, so that was very engaging. And it was almost like a how-to film for me, you know? So I really liked that. And then um, Broken Wings was, this was a very um, totally different film, you know? Um, and, and in many ways, what I'd call a pure documentary, you know, it, it, it uh, just let everybody in the film sort of speak for themselves and be themselves and it captured moments 
And as a, as a result, I, it had a realism to it that was quite affecting. Um, and these characters are very um, compelling characters and to draw the metaphor with the bird and their own personal lives, uh, there were lots of very touching moments. So I, 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 I did like that film as well. Um, so why don't we let somebody else take over from I there? I have a question for you, Scott. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love the way you wove in the, the history of the, of the river with the personal stories and, and then the, the back and forth between Carl and Mary as they're going down the river. And you, so it made the audience, it made me feel like I was actually going down the river. And I just love that because, you know, you get this history, you get these wide shots, you know, history wide shots, visual wide shots, and then you're in the boat with Carl and Mary. And how did you, as a filmmaker, um, you know, you, you can do that because you have to make all kinds of technological decisions. So you have, uh, how, how early did you decide to get the GoPro cameras and have them all over the kayaks in order to get us, the audience, in the river with mm -hmm. Carl and Mary? Well, it was, a, you know, a, a highly organized production. Um, and I will say, I will start by saying that, you know, it's, it's based on the book that Mary Bruno wrote. So right. I, which really, and the film was the inspiration for it. And, and, uh, and the book, describes the kayak trip that she took back in 2008. And, um, and basically she's revisiting the river again for the film. So we had sort of that as a guide. And then the river itself was sort of the, the guide to the, actually how the story was gonna unfold from the beginning to the end. Um, but, but I really wanted, I'm at a point in my career, you know, I've made a lot of documentaries and what excited me about this was the opportunity to cover something in a grand kind of way and both grand and intimate. So that you, you know, and the idea of cutting from close-ups in a boat to these drone shots is very dramatic. And you're experiencing the river, you know, by being on the water. And at the same time, you're getting a sense of it uh, geologically, you know, geographically. So, so we covered it with a lot of cameras. I mean, and that was part of the plan. You know, I, had, I had upwards of 10 cameras um, and uh, uh, four were GoPros. It's about four and, drone operators. And... I, had to, I, had, I had a drone crew. one one two-man drone crew. Um, and then um, my, my DP, Roger, came back uh, later on to get some additional drone shots. And then I had a couple of other crews that were kind of leapfrogging ahead of the kayaks from the shore, getting the shots from the bridges. Um, and then Roger switched off to a steady cam type camera, you know, where he follows them across Patterson's, the Great Falls, you know. Um, and I ended up with 150 hours of footage. Um, and right. It all felt really good to me. I mean, I, it was a joyous experience to, to capture everything. And, and actually the editing was a big challenge, but I, I really dug in and enjoyed that too. I, I saw that you were the editor, Scott. I was impressed. <laughs> as a, as Sarah, did you organize all that? Sarah, a, a question for you might be, <laughs> uh -huh. you started a movie 10 years before you, mm -hmm. did you, when you started the, when some of your early shots were they ones, were you thinking you were gonna document what you were doing? No, or you no, went back and all. found those no. as you? Uh, yeah, the, I love the shot of just a single butterfly arriving <laughs> early. Well, yeah, Wild in, the Garden, a moment. <laughs> Wild in the Garden State really began um, because we were totally new to gardening. We didn't, we didn't know, you know, we're coming from the city. And, you know, I worked as my career, part of my career at the American Museum of Natural History. So I, was, I had a, a career making ecology videos, cultural videos, and uh, explaining natural history to our visitors and so on. Um, but I'd never literally got a chance to get my hands in the dirt, you know, until we moved to the suburbs for the first time. I didn't know the names of plants. So it started with me going around with my, my mom saying like, is this, <laughs> is this a weed? Is yeah, this a weed? Yeah. I had no idea. Of course, now I'd say like, oh, you know, what's a, considered a weed is actually different than most people consider weeds. But so it started with that. And when we did um, our first native garden bed that uh, we got from a mail order catalog that sells exclusively native plants, um, we got this monarch that came. We'd seen monarchs along the coastline, but never in our garden, yeah. never around all the chemical lawns around us. And, and after three months, four, four months. Yeah, five, it's like months, immediately, it like planted miracle, the first know. season, the, these monarchs and other mm -hmm. pollinators came. And uh, I thought, oh, I think I have a documentary here. And I'd just been documenting it with my smartphone. And I just uh, continued with my smartphone because um, um, it's easy, accessible, that my garden's right there. And uh, um, I was a little bit shy to put it together with just smartphone footage, but yeah. I was extremely motivated to just to get the message out because 
just chatting with my neighbors, I found, you know, through no fault of their own, there's just so much ignorance about the importance of native plants and uh, how native plants are instrumental to the whole e ecosystem. And uh, um, there's just a lot of misinformation there. So I would kind of get into conversations with people and, and, and not want to say, you're doing it wrong. And, you know, being a documentary filmmaker, I wanted to have a way to explain this is how you how you do it. And uh, um, Dave being my architect husband, um, <laughs> I involved him early in and we wanted to make something that was beautiful so that people could appreciate it and a beautifully designed space that they could come to. So that's a long answer to, long <laughs> to your question, yeah. but yeah. but it was, it, it, I, I the I'm end was I was, yeah. we, I wanted to explain to people why. You were an architect like of buildings and you turned into yeah. landscape I'm architect. a registered oh, No, I'm a registered. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea I was going to be a gardener for the first 21 years of being in New York until the High Line started to go up uh, yeah, and right. it's outstandingly beautiful and beautifully designed. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. it, but it's sensational. And um, first of all, I want to say I, uh, my kayak straps, I roll them very tightly. Myself, <laughs> like I think Carl. the world could be divided into, you know, like <laughs> Carl and his daughter. And uh, I, I have to tell I you, also, Sarah, that every time <laughs> Carl comes and visits when the weather's nice, he brings me a native plant. <laughs> I also wanted to tell very, you. He's very committed oh, to, he's, he's a restoration ecologist, and one of his, his, his main jobs is, is on the Passaic, and he actually, he works for NOAA, you know, the, the, uh, the Oceanographic Agency, and, uh -huh. and he actually has to re restore the, na the native plant life, so he's all over that. And they're, they're, you know, so, so, so that brings our Carl stories full circle. <laughs> okay, um, we could go on and on, but Let's hear audience, let's ask some questions. I think, do we have some microphones or I'll bring mine around, but who would like to question uh, these two people or Scott? Someone has to go first. I can make a quick comment while, while somebody's yeah. getting up their courage or whatever. Uh, I just wanted to tell Scott that as an architect, I deal often in, you mentioned at one point about a river moving through space and time. Of course, mm -hmm. buildings, you know, I'm very concerned about circulation or um, space and time unfolding. And I can't think of a better structure to pin a movie on than a, a river. You know, you can hang on that thread, you can hang culture, you can hang history, you can hang ecology, you can, it, it just seems like a wonder, you must have looked at that and said, this is going to be a great movie. No, great. Well, I was pretty excited about doing it. And it was but it was very challenging, because there's so much going on, there's so many levels to it. You know? About architecture, I had done a film a while back that was shown on PBS about the rebuilding of an historic house that burned down. Yeah, uh, it was a Stanford White. With, and it was owned by Dick Cabot, actually, and uh, and they decided to rebuild it exactly as it was, and the whole approach was amazing, very much along the lines of what you were talking about. Um, with, you know, with the, the, the house has a spirit of its own, and even even you know where where it's positioned and its interaction with nature. That, that film also touched on those themes. So um, send me a note; I'll send you a DVD. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a question here, and then another question here. Please go ahead. Uh, sure. So one of the longer running issues communicate or generating political action around climate change is climate change communication. It's difficult to communicate the urgency of the problem or the, the scope of the problem. So I think this is getting a little bit better. Climate fiction is a is a literary genre that's gaining some steam. What do you think is so I have a two party question? What first, what do you think is special about film as a medium? in communicating environmental issues and two so we we just watched three documentaries why do you think there is uh there aren't so many fiction films about environmental issues why is that a, an issue hollywood or indie films do not frequently tackle mm -hmm. well, i'd like to have a gander at the first question go ahead um I, I feel like it's it, like just chatting with neighbors. I feel like the issues are so complex that I felt like I needed at least a half an hour just to explain how everything is interconnected. And uh, you know, a neighbor may ask, like, why shouldn't I have a, a butterfly bush? Well, it's invasive. What does invasive mean? And so then you have to have a little bit of a you know backstory about um, 
natural selection and what's natural selection. So um, I just felt like documentaries and filmmaking is a way to have all the complex parts of a story woven together and hopefully in an engaging way. So. I, I can answer that question. Is that good? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I, I um, documentary just became my, my genre, you know, after trying all kinds of things. So I can't speak for Hollywood or, you know, mainstream dramatic films as far as why or why not they tackle climate issues. But I've, I've always felt very comfortable um, kind of capturing reality when it comes to doing these stories. And somehow a lot of what I capture speaks for itself. We don't have to recreate it with actors and things like that. It's, it's all actually happening. Um, but the other part of that answer is that, you know, we, we, we've been invited to show American River at an international conference of water, the Waterkeeper Alliance in Washington, D.C. to 350 river keepers. And in speaking with the, the conference uh, leader, she said one of the great things about American River is that it's not the kind of environmental film where you leave feeling very dark or upset yeah. or you know anxious about it you leave feeling with a sense of hope and that was that's what makes my approach what it is 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 you know and in some ways not so commercial because um a lot of the documentaries that you see on mainstream television you know make you feel pretty bad you know i mean yeah. they think that that's the way you're you're supposed to get people to, to do things the way i think people should be motivated to do things is by falling in love with a place enough yes. to care about doing something about it right. that that's mary bruno's approach so so the theme of our workshop we're doing at the conference in washington dc is called film as a tool for advocacy and what we're going to do is talk about the importance of presenting environmental stories in a balanced way it's not just about you know either the, the dark for you know foreboding pollution issues and it's nor is it about the pretty rosy you know, looking at the nature through rose colored glasses like you see on nature all the time not that i i enjoy those films but it's not the kind of film i make so the idea of the balance view where we're seeing the passaic river from all different facets and, and a river as a complex a complex thing and, and as the waterkeeper um, alliance leader says it's, it's it's not just the channel the boats go up and down you know, it's 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 for recreation. It's 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 uh it's it's a site of, site of terrible pollution. It's it's um, uh you know it's it's got geologic wonders in it. And and so that was the approach I took was I was going to try to capture all those things in some some way. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I can I can answer the second question briefly. Um, in the history of Effie that I've been there have been actually very few fiction films shown, but there was one years ago which you may or may not have seen called The East which is about a, a cell of eco-terrorists, basically. Uh, has anyone seen it? Um, it had, yeah, okay. It, <laughs> it, it was the dark side of uh, eco ecological, the attempt to protect things. And it's about a relationship between a daughter and her father. The father's the polluter and the daughter's in, in the East. It's, it's, so there just haven't been many um, fiction shown, uh, but I agree with you. It's sort of a, there's been a lot of, um, poetry written about the environment. There's, you know, there, there's other forms of fiction, but interestingly, the movie pictorial version hasn't um, gone very much into the fiction side. Does anyone want to comment on that? The fiction in, in environmental literacy? Edward Abbey. Well, that wasn't a film, I'm sorry. Well, they did make a film later on. Okay, I think we had another question here. Can you use the mic, please? Just sure. Sure. In terms of fiction, I'm somehow I'm thinking of Hiroshima, or you know, it seems like there was some. I was thinking like Godzilla, fiction. right? Is like There's a metaphor. Some, do you? I'm not. It's not coming to mind, but I think if there was any fiction in film, it was around the bomb. I'm thinking. I'm so old that it seems like something <laughs> came way back, but I can't think of it. But I might. <laughs> yeah. Godzilla was like a metaphor for what Godzilla was like a metaphor for what happens with nuclear waste. <laughs> no, but um, you know, some Japanese film possible. that I'm thinking of the, the name I can't remember. No, it wasn't Godzilla. Another one. Yeah. Anyway, some some other film. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what is Scott's last name? I'm sorry, Morris. Okay, Mr. Morris, could I direct a couple questions towards you? Does he hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. So one, I wanted to know how long the movie took to make. Two, 
I am really surprised because, again, I'm so old that I remember when Superfund started, and I just don't understand why it took Newark so long to get to Superfund. I don't understand that. And three, you know, I've never watched a documentary about the environment. Well, all of these are so great. Samuel's my son, so I've got very lucky to <laughs> be able to see these. Um, but it just strikes, it is the ideal educational tool. And I could, I just think all of your films should be taken to the high schools and should be the greatest tools in the world for you know kids starting in the ninth grade eighth grade who have the ability to sit and 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 really absorb it you know, your film you know any kid who's into it, so fabulous and and about the river and just seeing the whole as you say you bring in so many different aspects it's not just oh the river it's polluted it's hideous we're all going to die type of thing so it was really cool but i don't know if you can remember those questions but i'm very confused about superfund what that was 41 years that it started yeah well i mean if you notice the timing well first of all the film took me three years to make um and you know it was it was a obviously a huge undertaking in editing and then the pandemic slowed us down quite a bit because uh, a lot of the work I do in New York City studios had to be like done remotely and whatnot. And, and also we had some big editorial challenges. So I brought in some extra, some help, you know, Keith Reamer, who's credited as a great editor, and he came in as a consultant and whatnot. But aside from that, um, you know, the timing of, of the actual dioxin um, event was a year before the Superfund was even formed, okay, 1983. And then the Superfund actually came came to be and not because of it but just that there were enough of this kind of thing going on in the country that that's when it happened so we immediately you know the, the powers that be started applying for funding and 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 uh, superfund had a long time to figure out how it was going to work um you know because the money to pay for those things does not come from the government or from our taxes it comes from the companies that cause the pollution so they have to engage those companies nail them to the wall basically and get them to be responsible. So, and then on top of that, they didn't know how much it was gonna cost because no one knew much about the oxen that, then, you know, and, and how, how toxic it actually was, is. You can't get rid of it. You know, it's not like some of the other things that are in the huts and the PCBs and whatnot that, that, that are easier to clean up as Captain Bill says in the film. But the oxen stays there, it sticks. And plus it's in this tidal estuary. So it washes up and down with the tides. It never goes away. So, um, the cleanup is an, in, is this huge engineering challenge. So um, so once it was declared a Superfund site, this was quite some time ago. It, it's it's taken you know as the lawyer says thirty five years to get to the point where they can actually actually have a plan. And now that they have a plan, that's going to take another ten years. So it's those are the kind of challenges um, that the Superfund um, program actually is all about. And then the companies that originated. The problem no longer exists. And there are a lot of changing of hands, grandfathering of, co of companies and whatnot. So it's complicated. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Into the high <laughs> well, the high school educational distribution is at some point down the road. Uh, uh, this film was expensive to make, and um, you know uh, we need to create some way of it generating revenues to kind of recover some of that and also help us continue with the promotion. So we're mainly looking for a distributor or a, more, or a couple of distributors. You know, we'd love to get it out to the general public in some way, like on a, on a larger platform. And then we'd also like it to go educational. And, but we're not gonna do that ourselves. Um, maybe we can to an extent, but not as much as it, it should be, which is what you point out, that if the film ends up in an educational catalog and is promoted as such, then anybody at some point down the road a year, two, three, you now we'll be able to um, either, you know, stream it or um, download it, or if DVDs are still being seen, maybe buy a DVD. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? No. Okay, um, I have lots of questions. <laughs> uh, we got a question. Okay, good. Okay, here's another question from the audience. Go ahead. I had a question uh, about the garden film. So you were living in New York City and then you moved to New Jersey and you had this garden. That's right. And you said it was the High Line in New York that sort of sparked the idea for the garden. 
So for people who live around a lot of concrete or aren't exposed to nature, could you speak about your experience, how in tune or how much attention, how did your sensibility and perception of nature change when you got out of the city and into New Jersey and how conscious a process was that of becoming more attuned to, so lots of your shots were of tiny things. So bu tiny bugs crawling on right. blades of grass. Mm -hmm. So those are details that you, you just miss in a concrete jungle. So I was just right. wondering if you could say more about your experience switching from New York to, to Jersey. I have to say I, I really was astounded by how ignorant I was just about basics in the natural world or just basic things like, you know, phrases like you reap what you sow or I'm planting a tomato seed. And for a, a split second, you think, wow, that's that seed in the seed packet. It looks just like a tomato seed, you know, like kind of just like things from ignorance, you know, that I was so uh, distance from just basics of, of nature, even after working, you know, in the Natural History Museum and, and making media for them. So, um, but your, your, the root of your question is, you know, what was, what was the inspiration, the early inspiration besides the, the yeah. High Line or? No, how would they, living in a concrete jungle, basically, how would they get in tune with nature? You know, what? Central about? Park? <laughs> I think it's experiential, unfortunately. You can't just, pick, you know, read John McPhee or something or, you know, I grew up in New Hampshire. I backpacked, I did. So even though I was in New York for 33 years and didn't see a lot of nature, you know, we made it to Central Park and yeah, you have to, you have to experience it to get excited about it. That's it why the butterfly was so great to, you know, it was, I mean, she worked at the Natural American Museum of Natural History for 20 years and, you know, she said there's so much she doesn't know about nature. There's, she, there's something about having a, a personal experience yeah. that's just like nothing else that, that, that can't, kind of can't be replaced. So. I used to have birds on our fire escape outside of our loft, you know, they, and they weren't just pigeons and, you know, I loved watching them and photographing them. Um, Scott, I want to bring up something that um, the two people that wrote the book with me would have brought up if they were still here. And that was the comment that one of your uh, interviewees made about uh, the river starts with the drop way up at the top of the hill and then it's all the water that drains down the whole the whole watershed and i thought you did a really interesting job of you know the bulkhead story where the where you, you the river is just that water that's in the bulkhead and then in you're in the in the meadows and at the at the end when you're up in the source did you have a sense did, how important was it to you what, how important was the story in the story was the idea of the whole river as opposed to Mary's uh, dealing with her um, history and the, and the pollution that she grew up in? Well, that the story of the whole river is very much in Mary's book as well. Um, and and um, so so and the book is sort of this blend of personal memoir and this kayak trip that she takes, you know, back in 2008. And meeting all these people um, who helped her understand the history um, and, and then and, and her, her scientific knowledge, uh, well, that kind of is blended together in the book. And I love that because it sort of appealed to so many aspects of the things that interest me. And I thought, how do we capture that on film? You know, So the interviews with Mary and Carl were a way of getting the foundation of that story. Um, and then the kayak trip was the way of bringing it to life. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 I can't take credit for ending the film at the source. It's the last chapter of Mary's book. Uh, and I just love the idea of after going and seeing all this devastation in Newark to go back and revisit that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, that, that contrast was very much in my mind all along, you know, in terms of, 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 of uh, the river starting with a drop of water and ending, you know, with this concrete, you know, channel. So, so the idea of, of capturing that was the challenge, you know, is, is what cameras do we use where and, and um, when do we use a drone and the early part of the river, you know, it's so skinny. I mean, going back to your GoPro question, um, you can't put another boat alongside the kayaks. You, the only way we could cover it was with the GoPros, you know, and a drone. And I wanted to get alongside them in a boat, but that couldn't happen until Great Peace Meadow, like a third into the film. Yeah. So, 
So we, we kind of tailored the coverage based on where they were and what we were trying to capture. Uh, another question, uh, statement for you, Scott, is history is very important. Um, and I really enjoyed the, you bringing the glaciers in and also the first peoples, uh, the Lenape that were there. Uh, and then of course, all the history of, uh, from Alexander Hamilton forward, uh, the mills, the, the early colonization. Um, when you were filming or in Mary's book, um, is the history pre settlers uh, pre um, colonial uh, that was a great story about the family where the father was in, in favor of the crown and the yes right, right. <laughs> was was in mary's book or did you did you and did you think of putting more of what might be called pre-colonial history into your story the, well there's not wasn't a huge amount of it in mary's book and i and i did think that i needed to cut, create some limitations to the to the way the film was structured and, and the limitation, the main limitation was that, was the kayak trip, was that it starts in the Great Swamp and it ends in Newark. And what are we passing along the way? You know, and what you're basically seeing is like a, you, you take, you go, you, you're traveling through 400 years of, of, of industrial, the industrial history of America. So that's the framework that I tried to stay, stay in, in terms of history. And um, uh, yeah, and that also dictated who I decided to, the other characters that I decided to speak to about it, you know, and some of which, were not in Mary's book, and we had to find, uh, and 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 some of which were in Mary's book, you know. So 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 the film kind of had to find its own course, you know. And it's also the first time, you know, even though Mary had been out on the river and was a kayaker, I'd never been on the Passaic until I made the film. <laughs> so so yeah. so w w what I was feeling at the time I made the film was this incredible sense of wonder and joy, and I wanted to share that with the with the audience, this experience of. of getting out on the river for the first time, I'm really discovering it. So, so I think that Mary and my sensibility is kind of dovetailed in that way. Um, we're gonna have time to talk more to the two up here, but I know you have to go pretty soon. But I, I wanted to ask you each a question about the concept of a film festival. Have you entered, do you enter your films? Have you entered this film in other film festivals that's being shown tonight somewhere else? How do you think about the, the role of film festivals in, in your profession, and, and then I'll come to you, sir. Oh, uh, well, I mean, you know, film festivals, um, the ones we get into, <laughs> I, I, I always thoroughly enjoy. I mean, you, 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 they attract you know, people with, with a lot of passion and interest in, in film. And, and they're also, you know, um, um, opportunities to really share with, with, with audiences, enthusiastic audiences. And, and it was a testing ground, you know, the couple of festivals we've been in so far to see if the film was what I thought it was, which is, you know, I want, I wanted it to be appealing to an audience. I wanted it to be not just about an environmental message, but I wanted it to be, uh, uh, you know, I wanted audiences to laugh and I wanted them to, to, you know, be in awe of certain scenes and that's proving to be true. So it's really festivals have really helped me feel good about my work and, and, um, uh, and that's helping me, with momentum, you know, going forward with everything else I'm looking forward to doing with the film. So, um, before Scott has to hop off, does anyone want to help him with his understanding? How did it affect? How did the movie affect you uh, going down the river? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Now, now someone has to put that into words. What did you like about the movie? I'm trying to get you to talk here. Come on. It's like a student. What did you like about his movie? What moved you? We've had the super fun story moved. We've had um, the role of it being uh, part of education. Yeah, way back in the back there, someone. Good. You're going to have trouble seeing this person, Scott. They're way back in the dark. Oh, well. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Scott. That was a um, really beautiful movie. I think what struck me. What struck me the most was um, how well you represented the people along the way and kind of how humanity has bumped up against the, the boundaries of nature in so many ways um, and how you really reached a lot of people that don't usually get into documentary films. Um, about everyone from the youth who is homeless sleeping in um, the the ruins to um, people talking about experiencing the river with their children. I think you did a really beautiful job telling those stories. 
Thank you. I mean, it's it's what I like the most about making documentaries is is um is, is talking to people, and a lot of people were telling me when I was in production, oh, you got to talk to the mayor of this and the governor of that and all the spokespersons who do their shtick, you know, about environment. I'm like, that's not what I'm interested in, you know. And I, and I like to engage people in conversations and not have too much of a preconceived notion of what I think they should say. I I, I actually I actually never put myself above my subject. I, I want to talk to them and and, and present a, a way to for them to speak in the most dignified way possible and, and to be themselves. And some people are surprised at that because all my interviews are usually very good experiences. People are very, um, they're very enjoyable. So uh, that was part, part of the, the fun of making the movie and, and also got me some really unexpected things. You know? <laughs> Another question. Well, it was more of that same answer that you had asked what we liked about the film. And I think it was amazing how you did the filming itself because it seemed as if there were no cameras. I did catch, I caught myself wondering, well, how did they do this? Because it was so intimate and yet so beautiful and you knew there were drones involved, but it was, it was very well done. Well, I have to give a lot of thanks to Mary Bruno and Carl Alderson because, you know, honestly, I love them as people. I've met them. We talked about the film a lot. I knew it was gonna be a fun experience, but when we put them together, side by side in kayaks on the river wearing those wireless microphones the spontaneous banter and the dynamic and the, and, and the fun they had made them much stronger characters than i ever expected you know so 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 in a lot of ways that the kayak trip is very much their experience of it and and, and the way they react to it you know um and and it's very entertaining and that and that was that was great to capture yeah so Scott, I think we have to let you go. It's looking like it might be close to you having to take questions and answer from another audience. But um, I can do I can do I can do one more if, if, if you want. I, I don't want to monopolize, but I, I have about five minutes. I think, so. Any more questions or comments or support for Scott? Did uh, did Roger Grange get lunch at Libby's? Oh yeah, well, Libby's was actually. Um, <laughs> A hangout for the crew um, uh, on days when we even weren't filming, you know, and it was like, it's not the kind of place you want to eat, make a regular diet of, obviously, but, but, um, but, but it's an experience, you know, and unfortunately, if you, if you, if you sat through the end credits, you see that it actually closed only after all these years, but, uh, but we were lucky to have had a couple of meals there and, and everyone there got to know me at, at Libby's too. So we were good tippers, you know, we were bringing like 15 people from the crew and <laughs> so it, that was a fun. Yeah, that was part One of the fun. things I wanted to comment being a, a New Jerseyite who grew up right sort of in that area, you actually went through Summit. Your, your illustration of the two parts of New Jersey was great. I mean, there's the Newark and there's the approach to the Great Meadow to New York City. And then there's the western part of the state. It's called the Garden State for those of you that don't know about New Jersey. And you got to see the two sides of it. Uh, so dramatically, um, and then I and I appreciate also that you ended on a very hopeful note. That was really oh, thank you very much. Nice yeah. to have that. So yeah, before I sign off, I just wanted to invite people um, to, um, to to visit the film's website and and join us. You know, there's a contact page, um, and you know we have more screenings coming up. We're going to be building out the website to have resources and other and and uh, updated with news, screenings, press, whatever. And, uh, and if you have any personal questions, you know, frankly, I'm a one man band. Well, likely, likely is I'll be the one to answer it. So, uh, so, so I'm inviting you to please contact me and I'm happy to, you know, to respond. And you can write a little note in the comments box there, or whatever you want to do and send your emails and I'll, and I'll put you on the mailing list. So, I mean, the, the website is Amer AmericanRiver.film, which we got lucky with, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much both for your film and for your time with us tonight. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, this has been been great. So thank you all for coming to the, see the film, too. Appreciate it. I hope we get to meet again. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bye, Scott. Bye. -bye. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry um, that we sort of um, focused on Scott, but we knew we had to get off. So um, I'm wondering if you could answer the question about the role of film festivals from, from your point of view. Um, well, I'll echo a little bit of what Scott said. It just kind of gives you uh, 
hope that you've done a good film. It's always it's always great to be um, to hear an audience their reaction. Like, are they going to laugh when they see the cat snoozing in the in the garden and yeah. things like that? Or are they going to? With this audience, I was thinking, oh, there, there's a European house sparrow in that house. Are they going to? They're going to tackle that topic yeah. later on. And, well, there's a cat in the garden. You know, yeah, that's, <laughs> right. That's a big bone of contention. So some. But uh, yeah, film festivals really. Um, we did a lot of screenings before, yeah. before I, while I was editing it, and uh, but when you're in an audience, there's nothing like just, just I'm just my ears are like tuned to the back, hearing all your reactions, and yeah. Um, the audiences are different in each festival, very different, very, very, very different, and it's it's an opportunity, like Scott was saying, to just meet people. So we mm. we just screened at the Garden State Film Festival, and I got to meet the founder of the Garden State Film Festival, and she asked me. If I could speak to one of her gardening groups, and I was like, "Yes, that's my key audience. I want to talk to mm -hmm. people who are gardening in suburbia to try to get them to see about gardening in a different way." I guess to a earlier question: Did you think of your, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Did you think of your film as an environmental education tool, or was this a memoir? Or well, let, I'll let Dave answer that. Uh, he had a... Well, I, people always ask us. You know, it was only half an hour. You know, uh, we didn't, you put a lot in there, but there's a lot more, you know, where do we start? Where do we go? Where do you get? And my immediate answer was it really wasn't a how to film, it was a why to. You know, it's just if you could start the educational process going. And, uh, you know, you'll find that we didn't know where to start, so you'll find out how to start too. But, you know, we want you to see those monarchs and see the fireflies when your neighbors can't, you know, I mean, our neighbors don't have fireflies because they have lawns that are spread with pesticides. And, and, uh, you know, it's a, that was the answer. It will inspire people, right? And I think one of the juxtapositions, certainly between your film and this last one, was the concept of history. These people, this film, American River, went back 400 or 10,000 years if you go back to the glacier. Mm -hmm. Well, yours back, she went back 10,000 years right with the <laughs> cardinal no, with the, I'm so but i mean in in terms of um the gar the plot of land you have now mm -hmm. did you in so a lot of a lot of lawns when you buy a have been industrialized they've had the pesticides and the fertilizers on them although your lawn at least from the early pictures looked pretty can i say ratty weedy which is great <laughs> that was a good sign to me that meant that mm -hmm. someone hadn't been putting pesticides on. Sandy but but it's uh, sandy yeah but did you did you think of the history of that particular spot or did you are you just trying to as you just said anybody can sort of start anywhere and start the process yeah when i when i started on this uh, started um thinking i'd make a documentary i struggled with like how much do i get into the history the wider community mm -hmm. how wide of a view do i want to get and and I thought, I just want to keep it simple. I wanted to do just our story and hopefully inspire typical suburban gardeners like us. And so I chose to focus just on the 130 foot length of lawn. And that kind of like gives viewers a key to, okay, we're transforming this rectangle of lawn and it gives you a, a, a way into the, into the story and what we're trying to do. But the history of it, I, I just, I just thought I didn't want to take that on because, like um, Scott, I'm just a one-woman band, and uh, you know that kind of requires a much bigger production crew. I think um, I, I pretty much did did all the except for uh, Dave got some great shots of of me. <laughs> I pretty much did all the all the photography and the animation and the editing and the script. So. I think if I wanted to tackle those wider issues, I, I needed to like really collaborate and get a bigger crew. So, so I just chose to keep it simple and small. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but after 20 years of filming for the American Museum of Natural History with big crews, it was all done on an iPhone or an iPro, you know? Those, I, I, used, okay. to, I used to come out and find her with her uh, binoculars and she'd have her camera set and she'd say could you click you know because she's photographing through an iphone through binoculars you know it, it was which is an advantage because i don't have to recoup any costs yeah. it's it, not not that much cost so. yeah we have yeah. a question too i'm guessing dad 
<laughs> Along those lines, uh, availability, I don't know if you're aware of it, but and I don't know how far it extends, but within Connecticut, there's a movement called Pollinator Pathway, and the, the whole concept being exactly what you did is that we can't uh -huh. necessarily right. get large tracts of land to right. improve our pollinators and our, our bugs and right. birds, and, and that every little yard linked together counts, and right. I think your film would be um, like like pollinator pathway on steroids as far as showing people you know what they could really do right. and, and you can read all kinds of books about it but having film like that available would be a real big booster for the communities trying to do that I, I do you have any plans to to put it out there where people could get it I would that I way? would love to I want to get as many eyes on this as possible and change gardening practices um but I think but you're asking about um film festivals it's kind of like that's almost the film festival um, uh, it takes almost a whole year to like enter all the festivals that you, that, that kind of work. You kind of wait for a year and then you're hoping that maybe somebody from a TV station like PBS will pick it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards you do things like try to sell it to um, libraries or schools or whatnot. But, but uh, I don't really need to recoup that many costs. So I'm willing to show this film anywhere and everywhere who wants to see it. Yeah. So I don't have any restrictions. There's, there's on. There's been interest. You know, each film festival, you know, there's always more interest coming. Our, her advisors, I don't know if you saw the people that she used, but they're from Jersey Friendly Yards, which is probably like your organization. You know, they're trying to turn every suburban yard into just yeah. a little island, even if you only have a couple trees, or I mean, a couple shrubs or a couple oak trees, or, you know, you that you create a series of islands. You know, Doug Tallamy has this concept of bringing it all home, bring nature home, or now he's got homegrown national park. You know, it's a it, it's a national park made up of thousands of yards that have a ten by ten area, say, of natural pollinator flowers. Yeah. Or you know, anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh no, that that, um, that just reminds me that uh, partnering with Jersey Friendly Yards, a local mm -hmm. organization that is all about getting suburban gardeners to plant native. I, I just called them and said, can you advise me on this to make sure the message is spot on? And uh, so I'm gonna partner with them and, and uh, show this at their, and their next annual conference yeah. and, and have it available on their website, so. So um, that, that helps me because as the role of moderator, when these movies ended, I tried to think, okay, what ties these movies together? And I must admit, I was pretty scared to get up here. But now I have oh, an item, thank you, which is the role of the individual, because we have here the individuals in their plot of land making a difference. And we certainly have um, in this middle film, it's all about one or multiple, but an individual who adopts Adonis, adopts Anne, I think her name was, mm -hmm. and and then in the last movie was I got, you know, the, the big actor might be the super fun side or EPA, but actually, if you recall, there were a couple of key individuals that made a difference, like the person, the gentleman who saved the, what was the swamp, the peace swamp or something like who that, brought up the land. Who, who brought up all those little segments and he buy one up just so that someone couldn't make a, a subdivision that out of it, pretty that clever of him. So I think that that's one of the takeaways of these three films is the role of all of us individually um, in little ways. Um, and then some, some people who have mm -hmm. the foresight are lucky enough to save a whole marsh or a whole swamp. And then some people, um, a whole bunch of people get together and can save um, the whole river or at least start to clean up the river. So that's, I guess, maybe a hopeful sign that, that we all, we humans can have, um, it can gets, reverse this process a little. It gets back to his comment about uh, once you do something like this, we'd had a very small yard. Well, I mean, a small scale compared to the Passaic River, but there we have a sense of stewardship over that land. You know, it's a half an acre, third of it's not that big, but we really have a sense of stewardship. You know, and you can only get that when the first butterfly comes or when your first plant blossoms and the bees come or the uh, and you know all these films I think were about stewardship you know that the woman with the uh, the broken wing I mean that was incredible you know she followed it it's a, it's almost like if I could say it's it's like you're in love with it it's uh, yeah. I think uh, in broken wing she was in love with uh, uh, 
Adonis, and and so she cares then about that you part of nature, steward, yeah. that overlooked part of nature. We, and and you were in love with your lawn, yeah. your front yard. And I'm in I mean, love with my weeds. Your, and your bees. I, I'm the bird guy. You know, I go out every morning. I don't even if it's freezing. You know, I go out in my shorts because I'm from New Hampshire. But I empty the bird bath. Doesn't feel the cold. Because you have to have water to draw birds. I empty the bird bath, which is just a garbage can lid, and I'm out there in snow and you know and I, I look, the birds are. They depend on us. They depend on me. I depend on them, my well being, like you were saying. So I just had a thing. Um, thank you so much for this film. Um, I think it's pretty wild that it took 10 years to get here and beautiful product. Um, is there something that we can expect to see 10 years from now, the next project? <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting. Um, during the pandemic, that gave me a chance to edit this, and I'm still kind of fingering: Do I still want to do filmmaking? I kind of want to do landscape design, or just do do something with native plants. I'm not sure what my as I pivot to some other role. Now, now that this, now that Wild in the Garden State is done, I'm going to try to get freelance work again, or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> well, you have the blog. You have the blog going. That's true. That's yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that didn't fit into the film. I just like, oh, you know what? I'm going to turn this into a blog. So you go to sarahgalloway.com. You can look for the wild blog and anything. Yeah. There's, it, the topic is so big and it's so, um, uh, there's so much to talk about, uh, especially the wider political things that it's not in the documentary yeah. that, uh, that I just put into a blog post. So. <laughs> I, I think that that's um, certainly for the, your movie and the, set, the last movie, um, one of the contrasts was scale, and mm -hmm. it was great to have these two because we had just this little front yard. Yeah. And you know, as an example, the the monarch butterfly could have in the in this in the last movie, the monarch butterfly would have been a whole story about the migration and shots of Mexico and all the. But in in the first, it's just there as a beautiful little thing, and it's not you didn't need to evoke all the connections. And so I think that the three movies work really well again in that way we have just the sort of the view of the world out your front window and then we have the attempt to bring in all the connections and and having those two types of movies together was really um really fun for us um i think we want to bring this to an end i guess i would give um our resident artist the last word is there anything you want to say about the movies or anything that's been discussed I just had a small comment that I didn't get a chance to make yeah. uh, in terms of our movie trying to be an, or her movie trying to be an inspiration. Um, uh, she was very adamant about showing all our mistakes because we really didn't know what we were doing. So by showing all our mistakes, and by the way, I've since put an even smaller hole on the birdhouse because, you know, <laughs> Those damn sparrows, somebody got in there, sparrows. you know, and so now we're down to chickadee size. So, but by showing all our mistakes, it makes it accessible to people, you know, hey, where do I start? Well, you don't have to worry about where to, you know, just do it. Start making, you know, those bee bombs look terrible. And then when we move the elderberry, they look terrible. And then she shows it, you know, a year or two years later, and they're, you know, they're taller than we are. You know, I don't... Anyway, that was just a small comment about <laughs> That's a, I think that's a great closing comment, actually. Yeah. So yeah. thank you all for coming, and thank you, thank you for, for coming. your film. Thanks for the opportunity. And let's see, we probably, we probably have an ad for upcoming events. Yeah, just real quickly. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for, for staying and engaging with all this. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say again, thank, thank you to our filmmakers. And um, you know, I really, for, for in behalf of the whole FE team, um, you know, going through all these films, like we said, I think we had 100, 130 even or so films, um, and so many great films. Um, but you know, these these really stood apart for um, all of the in informative content and, and the passion and the vision. Um, and, and as the as the theme of this panel uh, is called noticing nature, as we've said, and it's really the um, you know that that tied these films together for me. Um, for all of us, and a really beautiful job, and we just appreciate the work and everything that went into it. So tomorrow, um, we'll have a matinee and an evening um, screenings and panels as well. So just you know, you can check our website or you're registered already, maybe. And and, and also, you know, these um, if if you're not able to come in person, that's why we have this whole virtual setup so you can view films uh, remotely, tune into the panel live or, or or later. So 
Um, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, Abby.